Watch this. After months away, a group of Idaho lawmakers back at the Capitol today for the second, the second ethics hearing of the year. Earlier this year, the House Ethics Committee held a hearing for a now former lawmaker accused of raping a state house staffer. The second ethics hearing actually stems from that first one with Representative Priscilla Giddings sharing a link on her social media pages and then on her newsletter that included the name and the picture of the alleged rape victim, Jane Doe. So a group of two dozen lawmakers signed onto a formal ethics complaint that asked for an investigation and a hearing into Representative Giddings her, for her behavior on becoming a lawmaker. Lawmakers heard hours and hours of evidence and testimony today and they just wrapped up earlier just a bit ago right around three o'clock. Joe Paris is at the state house right now and Joe, how did the ethics committee come to a conclusion today if they did at all? Yeah, so they're actually going to come to a conclusion, we assume, tomorrow. They're going to take the rest of the afternoon and this evening to deliberate, and they are set to meet again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. But what did the committee hear this morning? Well, the first part of the morning was a group of lawmakers that had actually signed on to the ethics complaint. We heard their perspective and their point of view, some of them sharing the opinion that they thought that the way uh, Representative Giddings acted was inappropriate with her posts on social media, saying that they also didn't think she was entirely truthful during her testimony testimony during the first ethics hearing earlier this year. Now, none of the lawmakers came out and said that she was a liar, but some of the lawmakers said that they don't think she told the full truth or she told half truths. Later on this afternoon, we heard from Representative Giddings. Uh, to be quite frank, she made it clear that she really didn't want to be there. She has said recently that she thought all of this really was a political play, so it was uh, pretty tense, understandably, between Giddings and the House Ethics Committee. Um, I do want to play a, a selection for you here of the interaction between the committee and Giddings so you can get an idea. We'll roll that for you now. Representative Giddings, the group complaint on the second page, as you pointed out, the penultimate question or penultimate sentence, it says further the appearance of dishonesty while under oath. And so I'm asking if you would like to clear up your response to Representative Gannon's question about pictures about that news article. In that complaint, they were referencing a different statement that I made. And I will stand by my statement that everything that I said that day was accurate to the best of my knowledge. Mr. Chairman, yes, Representative uh, in that group um, complaint, it's, I believe, the third paragraph down. It, this is referenced directly in there, starting with second Representative Giddings appeared to misrepresent her actions to the Ethics and House Policy Committee while under oath. It goes on to say, when pressed further by a committee member who pulled up her Facebook post, that would be Representative Gannon, and could see the photo, she feigned ignorance. And again, I'm a very blunt guy, Representative. I, you post, you didn't post. Just let us know. Just be candid with the committee. Tell us yes or no. Don't, don't hedge this way and hedge this way and play these, these semantics and games. It makes it much more difficult for the committee in trying to determine what the outcome, what your intent was, how this went down. So if you would answer the counsel's, counselor's question, I would appreciate it because it is very explicitly spelled out in the complaint. Mr. Chairman, if you're going to accuse me of playing games, then do I get the opportunity to accuse you of playing games? I think you have, Representative. And misstating the rule and doing other things and little allusions to that we're not doing things according to House Rule 45 and that you're being impugned somehow in doing that. You've impugned the committee thereby. So, uh, a lot of back and forth and a lot of questions about what will happen tomorrow. I just really want to quickly reiterate Representative Giddings maintaining today that she said that she was truthful during her testimony during the Von Ellinger hearing. And she says that when she shared that link, she was unaware that it included Jane Doe's picture and image. She said that she only skimmed the article before posting it online. Uh, Brian, there's been questions about where this could go from here. There's a few major options the committee could go with. Um, they could come back tomorrow and say after hearing the evidence and hearing testimony, we decide we're going to drop the whole thing together. Uh, the other scenario they can do is the House Ethics Committee can recommend actions, anything from censure to all the way up to expulsion for the full House to vote on. If they go that way, Brian, eventually the full House would have to vote on any recommendations. You mentioned she kind of refused to answer a lot of questions, making a point of saying, I'm not sure why this is relevant to uh, this hearing. At one point, even saying, 
I'm not sure why how I run my social media pages is relevant to this, when in fact that's kind of the basis of what is happening today and possibly tomorrow. All right, thank you very much, Joe. All right, we showed you this video last week from the Oakley Pioneer Days Rodeo. There's been a lot of you who were shocked at how this was allowed to happen, how fireworks and Roman candles could be used to make the cows a little more wild during the wild cow riding competition a couple of weekends ago. At least that's how it was described to us by one of the rodeo board members. You can see that here, who also said they've been doing this for a few years. And he also admitted to us, yeah, it got a little out of control a couple of weekends ago. A lot of you were calling for an investigation into how it got this out of control. And now so has PETA, the people for the ethical treatment of animals. That fact, probably not as shocking as the actual video of that event. I mean, this complaint was inevitable, right? When PETA found out about this, well, they said this. Rodeos are traumatic and dangerous enough for animals, even without the use of fireworks, to whip the animals into a frenzy for the enjoyment of the crowd. So they sent a letter to the Cache County Sheriff and the prosecutor, citing Idaho code and asking for an investigation into animal cruelty. And they want the people responsible, the rodeo organizers, well, to be held responsible. We did reach out to Cache County to see if this is actually happening, this investigation. McCord Larson, the county prosecutor, responded with, I do not comment on active cases until investigation and or prosecution is concluded. He wouldn't confirm if there was an actual investigation taking place, but that comment until the investigation is concluded well, kind of says it all. A cache of coins is what you used to carry if you were going to park downtown and no, not just Boise. Decades ago, Murphy put in a parking meter to get a problem under control. It's still there and it still works. Well, at keeping people from parking there, that is. Have a unique story idea you want to share with us? Or how about a clever comment or two that we can share with the rest of the class? Text them to us at this number, 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name in the hashtag, the 208, and stick around. We're going to share a few of your messages at the end of the show. All right, full disclosure, when we set out to do this next story, we knew it had already been done by a pretty good and memorable member of KTVB staff, John Miller. And usually when that happens, we go diving into the archi archives and we try to bring you a 208 redial, usually with an update to bring it some sort of rel relevancy. And normally that means heading into the basement and pulling a tape off the shelf. And we did that. However, this story, the original was done so long ago, it's on a tape that is, well, rather irrelevant. <laughs> You see, kids, this is a three quarter inch tape. See how thick that is? Technology that was last used in the 1990s, and we no longer have a tape deck to play this thing. But the good thing about what we're about to show you is, even though the faces have changed, the story really hasn't. It's been the same for nearly seven decades, much like the subject of this story, standing sentry as a singular parking protector. We're heading out to Murphy for today's Get to Know Idaho. Alongside State Highway 75, in the shadow of the Owyhee Mountains, 
sits the not-so-sizable town of Murphy. At one time, considered by some to be the smallest county seat in the country, just four square miles. There's not too much to Murphy. You won't find a gas station or a grocery store, a place to eat, or a sidewalk. There's not a traffic light either. But there's an airstrip and a museum, a post office, and a courthouse. Where out front, you'll find a parking meter. And uh, it's a Waihee County's only parking meter. A distinction this duration determiner has had for decades. Oh yes, it has. Marcy Peterson. I'm the recorder. Has had her eye on it for 15 years. Can you see it through the window there? How often do people park in front of that thing? Oh, hardly ever. I mean, there's plenty of places to park, right? Right. <laughs> Which is why one would also ask, in a place with all this space, there's metered parking in Murphy? Uh, why? Why not? Uh, good question. I always assumed it was a joke. Oh, yes, yeah. Was, Nick Eiley knows. Folklore, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> it's a story that predates his appointment as county clerk. Yes, that happened uh, 1956. And apparently, the parking meter was put in by his predecessor, Kenneth Downing, in 1953. Supposedly, he put it up so that he'd always have a place to park. So, in a town of little more than two dozen people at that time, parking was really <laughs> at a premium? Well just one of those things. No, there's got to be more things, more to this story. Well, back in the 50s, there used to be a gate right here. Ah, uh, yes, ask the guy who knows Hawaii history. And this is one piece of history right here. Eric Scarsvo says the biography of this coin box goes back to when the county seat was moved from Silver City to Murphy in 1934. Two years later, they built the courthouse but they wanted more than just a bland building. And they put the lawn in probably in the late 30s, early 40s here. It probably was the only lawn in Murphy for a while. And back then, Murphy was in the middle of open range cattle grazing, which would make a patch of green grass a pretty good spot to hang out for a cow. And then with the grazing came other things and the, the groundskeeper says, I'm done with that, so. So to fix that problem. They put in a chain link fence. And this is this fence, it's still here. That kept the cows out but also the people. So to let the people in, we'll put a gate right in front of the path, right in front of that front door, we'll put a nice gate there. Seems like an easily solved problem. Pretty much, until someone parks in front of your gate and you couldn't get into the courthouse then. Another problem, but the plan could be salvaged. And the parking meter I heard came out of um, the Nampa dump. They went up there and they found it sitting there and they brought it down and stuck it right here. And, and after all these years. And look how much it is, how 10 much? pennies or two nickels. It's probably pulled in a pretty penny or two for the county. That's a really good deal for, for parking out here, yeah. I wonder how much money... None. What? Never did work very good, no. I think I heard one time they pulled maybe 10 bucks out of it. People came there and they'll try to put money in it, but uh, it never did work. <laughs> so here sits a plugged parking meter. That's where the clerk parks. But you don't. No, I don't. Where people never park. No, never, and I certainly wouldn't put any money in it. <laughs> in a place where parking isn't really a premium. Uh, it's probably more of a conversation piece than a deterrent, I would guess, yeah. And that's perfectly appropriate. It's become part of the Hawaii County history, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that we're famous for something. <laughs> the parking meter was pilfered once, back in 2001, and yes, John Miller did a story on that too. And yes, they were devastated. Their main attraction was abducted. However, they never found it and they never found out who did it. They just replaced it with the one you see there now. And while we were there, Eric Scarsvo, the director of the Waihee County Historical Museum that you just met, he took it down to see if he could get it working again. And he told me today he's close. So if you do plan on heading to Murphy and you plan on parking right in front of the courthouse, you might want to put some pennies in your pocket and prepare to feed the only parking meter in Hawaii County.
Gold was first discovered in this area we now know as Idaho, up north near present day Pierce in 1860. Miners seeking their fortune flooded into the Idaho territory from all over. Of course, that wasn't the only place. The story goes George Grimes and Moses Splon were the first to discover gold in the Boise Basin. Splon was apparently told by a Native American there was so much gold just lying around it could be picked up by the fistfuls. So they went there. They eventually found it on this day, August 2nd, 1862, along creeks that would later be known as Grimes and Moores. And between 1863 and 1959, 2.8 million ounces of gold was pulled out of the Boise Basin. It's an area roughly of about 300 square miles and includes places we now know as Grimes Creek, Moores Creek, Pioneerville, Centerville, Placerville, and most of that led to the establishment of Idaho City, and it became one of the most populated places in the Northwest. Within a couple of years, it was the largest town between St. Louis and San Francisco, the largest city in the Northwest at the time. But it wasn't always known as Idaho City. There's gold in them thar hills, and in this day in history in 208. In 1863, the same year Idaho officially became its own territory of the United States, Gold was the driving force behind the flooding of people into the Idaho Territory. The hot spot was Idaho City, but back then, this thriving metropolis was known as Bannock City. With its very own newspaper, who put out its first edition on September 29th of that year. But other papers were publishing portrayals of Idaho's prosperity, like this one from the North Iowa Times. On December 23rd, 1863, reprinting a letter dated in October of 1863, from the Leavenworth Times in Kansas. It calls Idaho the new El Dorado and describes the Boise Basin load as being between two dozen mountains, so high you would have to look twice before you could see the top of them, and that we never see the sun rise in this valley. But also, it is one of the most desolate places you can imagine on the globe. A canyon filled with four to 500 inhabitants, mostly miners, who are all doing first rate, much better, old miners say, than California. These are facts, and I presume this country will prove the richest poor man's mining country ever discovered. Which it seemed to be, because as the Smoky Hill and Republican Union in Junction City, Kansas put it on December 1st, 1863, in their news gleaning section, a Dr. Lovejoy arrived at St. Joseph from Bannock City, Idaho, with 300 pounds of gold. Just to let you know. And just to let you know, 300 pounds of gold in 1863 was worth about $82,000. By today's count, that same 300 pounds would be worth more than $8 million. And also from the Midwest, the Charles City Republican Intelligencer, March 31st, 1864, publishing a letter from Kansas City, which they called direct and reliable from Idaho. A Dr. E.D. Ralph, an old and well-known citizen of this city, went to Bannock last year with a stock of goods and has just returned. As to the gold, it is there, he says, and in large quantities of a very pure quality found in nuggets as well as dust. In fact, he tells the story of another Kansas City man, Jim Vivian, who spent a couple of years in Colorado and made nothing. But he's now in Idaho, in charge of 20 men and taking out $1,200 a day. The doctor says the trip can be made from here to Bannock in about 70 days, but you might want to bring provisions to last six months. However, if you did set off on that 70 day jaunt to Bannock City after reading that letter, you'd arrive in a place that no longer existed. Bannock City was established in 1863, as we established. That September, the Butler brothers began the Boise News. That's the weekly newspaper that we showed you at the beginning of that story. It took only a couple of months to change the name of the town, though, to avoid confusion with Bannock, Montana. The Boise News wrote this on February 20th, 1864. The good people of Bannock were astonished on Sunday morning to wake and find themselves in a new city, but not among strangers. By some transmutation, the whole population, houses and all, were in Idaho City. So Bannock City only existed a mere few months, but it certainly left its mark around the rest of the country. Okay, the U.S. leading the Olympic medal count, but who's your second favorite Olympic team? Who are you rooting for besides America? Maybe the country from where your mom's side of the family originated or your dad's grandfather. Because after all, we all came from somewhere 
else, right? At one point, Ireland maybe, Mexico, Kenya. What about the Basque country? Yes, we know, not an official country as far as the Olympics are concerned, but for Boise it certainly is. Boise is, after all, home to the largest Basque population per capita outside of Spain. Ten days in the competition, we thought we'd check in with Team Basque, and that's what we thought we'd do. Take a listen. Yep, the national anthem that you are hearing right now is of the Basque country. And no, they don't get to field their own team, but there are a number of Bas Basque athletes competing under Team Spain, more than 20 to be specific, including the first Basque athlete to win a medal at these games. Mylan Churunt. Yura Mendy, she took home silver in the women's canoe slalom last week. Then there's one of the more traditional Basque events, that's handball. Three Basque athletes are competing in handball under the Spanish flag, including Naraya, Pena, Aburera, who you see on your screen there. The team, women's team was eliminated in group play, but the men face Sweden in the quarterfinal tonight, 10-15, mountain time. Several play on the men's Spanish soccer team. They are unbeaten after the group stage, but have scored just two goals. Yeah including that gentleman right there who sent the uh, Spain into the semifinal. They're going to face Japan tomorrow morning. Kickoff set for 5 a.m. Mountain Time. Mark Johnson probably knows this guy right here. A lot of us do, right? That's John Rom Rodriguez. He's from Barica. And if the name does sound familiar to the rest of us, because he just won the U.S. Open back in June. Unfortunately, he had to pull out of the games at the last minute after testing positive for COVID-19. Don't fret, though. Another Basque golfer is getting ready to compete for Spain. On the women's side, that's 2012 Rookie of the Year, Carlotta yeah, this is going to be a tough one. Machina will. Yeah, she's going to tee off. Machenia, that's what I'll go with. She's going to tee off in the women's individual event on Wednesday. And we just barely brushed the surface of the Basque athletes that are competing in Tokyo. Sailing, cycling, spring canoeing. Uh, we've got tennis, track and field, marathon, basketball, water polo, field hockey, badminton, and swimming. You can keep up to date with all of them. See the entire list of Basque athletes competing in Tokyo at KTVB.com.
All right, final minute of the show today. Let's take a look at some of the comments you sent in. A lot of you sending in comments about the uh, Representative Giddings and her ethics hearing today at the State House. As a sexual assault survivor, I know Representative Giddings' actions are beyond disgusting and hurtful to all women who are victims of sexual abuse. She deserves much more than sanctions, says Jan in Meridian. Does Giddings just skim all the bills she supports, like she skimmed the article she reposted? Probably. That's what Jill seems to think about Representative Giddings. I imagine that Giddings would not accept non-answers like hers at today's ethics hearing from her children, if she has and If she truly didn't know that her post didn't contain Joe's name, Jane Doe's name and picture, ignorance is no excuse, says Nancy in McCall. On a lighter note, isn't Peter the same group that thought they had a case to rename Chicken Dinner Road? Yes, they were, but that's not shooting fireworks at rodeo animals. I'm a grandmother. My high school boyfriend and I drove to Murphy to feed the parking meter looking for fun. Old style high school entertainment. Thanks, Sue.